Why the flare-up between Armenia and Azerbaijan? A Russian-brokered ceasefire seems to be holding so far after the worst fighting since last year's 44-day war over the disputed enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh. This time it's also a border dispute, one that was being negotiated. We'll ask about the stakes surrounding what is a crossroads for neighbors like Iran and uh, Turkey, and also uh, the role played by Russia, broker of last year's truce and allied both with Armenia, where it has a military base, and with oil-rich Azerbaijan, whose leader Ilan Aliyev has proved deft in courting both Moscow and Turkey. Can the Kremlin play peacemaker in the Caucasus while it takes on NATO and the EU on its western front 30 years on? What does it all say about the former Soviet Union? Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at the flare-up between Armenia and Azerbaijan. With us, French Member of Parliament Jacques-Marie Lossian chairs the France-Armenia Parliamentary Friendship Group. You're just back. Thank you for being with us. Good evening. Uh, from Baku, Javid Aga, journalist at BNE Intellinews, which covers emerging markets. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Good evening. From Berlin, he's Georgia's former European Integration Minister, Tornike Gordadze, a senior fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Good to see you. Good evening. Thank you. And from Moscow, Andrei Kortinov, Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council think tank. Thanks for joining us again. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation, and you have on Facebook and Twitter, Hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, the last year's war was all about that enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh, an Armenian-speaking territory surrounded by uh, Azerbaijan. Monday's clashes about Baku's exclave, you could call it, of Nakhichevan. Monty Francis has more. More than a year after a ceasefire ended a war over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh, tensions between Armenia and Azerbaijan are once again on the rise. The ceasefire agreement itself is at the center of the latest conflict. Article 9 provides for the construction of new transport routes linking the autonomous republic of Nikichevan and the western regions of Azerbaijan a path that travels over the Zangazor Mountains and through the Sunik region in southern Armenia. The project is moving ahead, according to the president of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, who said in a statement, the Zangazor Corridor is a project capable of connecting the Turkish world, Europe and our neighbors. And today, active work is underway to realize this project. To that end, the Azerbaijani army has taken control of nearly 40 square kilometers within Armenian territory. For Azerbaijan, it's a matter of having a direct route to Nakhichevan, which happens to be at the Turkish border, which is Baku's political and military ally. For Armenia, it is an extremely difficult decision to make, since it is a question of accepting that its two enemies can cross its territory. On Tuesday, Russia's defense minister brokered a ceasefire that brought the fighting to a stop, at least for now. This week's clashes are the worst since a six-week war last year over the Nagorno-Karabakh region, which claimed the lives of more than 6,500 people. Okay, so it can be a little confusing for people who don't follow this on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Jacques-Marie Lossian, what we know is uh, that you have people who are Armenian, who are Azeris. They're not all in one homogeneous group. And if we look at this map, we get a sense of uh, why the fighting is taking place. Explain to us uh, what, what happened on Monday by looking at it. Oh, uh, you have to go back to uh, one century ago. Uh, the, the region of uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was inhabited by, let's say, at the time, 95% Armenian people at that time, in the, uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And then uh, when uh, the uh, Soviet Union was created, um, Joseph Stalin in 21 uh, gave the Nakhono-Karabakh region to the Federation of Azerbaijan, despite the fact that it was inhabited by 95% of uh, Armenian people. And in these regions, you have churches, monasteries that have maybe 1,000 years, right? 
And uh, after that, during the uh, Soviet Union, the population changed a little bit. And then the uh, proportion of uh, Armenian in Karabakh went down to 80%, right? But at the time the uh, Soviet Union collapsed in uh, 91, these republics that belong to Soviet Union declare their independence, Georgia, Azerbaijan, and of course, Armenia. And inside Azerbaijan, the uh, district of uh, uh, Karabakh declared its independence. So you've got... Uh, Ar an Armenian enclave inside of Azerbaijan yes. and a uh, Azeri, Azeri enclave, enclave between next. Turkey, between Turkey, Iran, and, and and Armenia. So Monday's clashes. What happened? Uh, as far as I know, and as far this is uh, confirmed by uh, uh, international authorities, uh, some people are claiming that it has been uh, a border clash. Uh, I was in, in, in Armenia the last three days. What I heard, it's not a border clash uh, uh, after a provocation by Armenian uh, uh, military uh, troops. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the uh, Azerbaijan uh, army tried to enter uh, the uh, state of the region of Sunik because for them it is the shortest way to Nakhichevan. And as far as I know, Mr. Aliyev is, of course, intended to intending to uh, create uh, a corridor between Nakhichevan and, and uh, Azerbaijan. As of today, we are, based on my experience, manipulated by the uh, Azerbaijanis government, which is always claiming that uh, is just the uh, Azeri army is just responding to uh, Armenian provocation. Right. Which is, to my view, a nonsense. All right, Javid Aga, I don't want to go into who started the shooting on Monday because neither you nor I were, were, were there present. But let me ask you, uh, uh, what's your reading of what happened? You heard in that report a moment ago our correspondent say that uh, this had followed uh, negotiations uh, over transit through these enclaves. Yes, uh, till Monday there have been uh, statements by the foreign ministers of uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia that they are, get, they are getting positive signals from uh, both sides on the negotiations. It mean, uh, the way I read it, it I mean, uh, it seems that they were close to some deal, but there was one thing that they did not agree upon. And I think that it is not about the corridor. The opening of transportations were already in the statement of November uh, back in uh, 2020 when the war ended. There have been clear statements that both Azerbaijan and Armenia should let each other to go to uh, whatever, whatever they want via the territories of the countries. But uh, what Azerbaijan wants right now is to make Armenia to accept uh, border demarc demarcation, which, that, which would mean that acceptance of Karabakh inside Azerbaijani territories. And I think that this was the real problem, that Armenia uh, did not want it to happen. They, they are going to say, uh, let's discuss status of Karabakh matter later. But Azerbaijani stance is that there's not going to be any uh, status for Karabakh. So in my opinion, it's more about uh, making Armenia to accept Azerbaijani uh, borders that uh, in no way demarcated because since uh, Soviet Union breakup, there were no any diplomatic relations uh, between these countries. But there have been negotiations and uh, we uh, uh, saw back in February uh, Armenia's prime minister welcoming the news that Azerbaijan was going to restore a key rail line that uh, would link uh, Russia uh, to the go, go through the region. Why can't they finalize that deal? Yes, uh, as I as you have also mentioned, uh, this is not about transport. This is about some strategic heights that where Armenia or Azerbaijan can monitor each other's territories. Now, when you capture a strategic height, it means that uh, you are uh, controlling, virtually controlling the other side's territory. You are looking upon their villages. And uh, these are the one of the main uh, points in this conflict.
Andre Kortinov, for you, what's this about? Why were they fighting on Monday? Well, I think that uh, there are many issues uh, on which they cannot agree. But the most important issue, of course, is the future status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, if you take the uh, Azeri position, uh, they reject that such a problem exists. Uh, for them, uh, the problem is resolved. Uh, Karabakh is back to Azerbaijan, uh, and uh, they do not uh, intend to sign any new international agreements on the status of this territory. When you go to Yerevan, of course, uh, the position is very different. Uh, they do believe that uh, the issue is not resolved, uh, that uh, the question of self-determination should uh, uh, be raised once again, uh, and they hope that sooner or later uh, this territory will uh, become uh, independent from Azerbaijan, and uh, later on it might be uh, reunited with Armenia. So the issue of status is, uh, of course, uh, the most difficult issue, and uh, this is an issue that cannot be resolved at this stage. On top of that, uh, we have uh, the issue of demarcation, and indeed uh, uh, both sides uh, appeal uh, to all Soviet maps, uh, and uh, they have different uh, reading of these maps. So these border clashes are unfortunately uh, almost unavoidable. Uh, plus, uh, there are more specific issues related uh, to the uh, recent conflict. Uh, Armenians uh, claim that uh, uh, Azerbaijan detains uh, some of the prisoners of war, uh, while uh, the side argues that Armenians uh, are not ready to share the maps of the uh, map. Uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and that's why, you know, they put uh, the... Uh, All right, the, li the line's breaking up slightly there, Andre. We're going to try to uh, reconnect Sorry. with you. Uh, ap apologies for that. Uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. We're having okay. a bit of crackle on the on the phone line. Uh, Tornike Gordadze, uh, is this going to go on forever, or is there common ground between Armenians and, 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 and Azerbaijan? Um, this conflict uh, has started uh, uh, with the uh, with the end of the Soviet Union. Even it started even before the end of the Soviet Union. As soon as uh, Perestroika was launched by Mikhail Gorbachev, the first uh, uh, claims of the uh, of uh, the Armenians who inhabit this region of nagorno karabakh was to reunite it, to reunite back with uh, with Armenia. So this is a very old conflict. We can even go even uh, uh, much. Uh, Earlier in the history, uh, the beginning of the 20th century, there were already clashes between Azeris and Armenians in different so it's, it's parts of the It's an old conflict, so therefore it's this... impossible to resolve? Is that what you're saying? No, I don't think nothing is, nothing is impossible. We, we <laughs> saw in Europe, in the European continent, the, the conflicts, the, like centuries-old conflicts between Germany and France, between uh, the Britain and, and France and Britain and Germany, and major European uh, countries solved and uh, um, now they, we, they live uh, peacefully. Of course, nothing is impossible, but uh, these uh, actors should have interest in resolving the, the conflict. And also, don't forget that these countries are relatively small countries, Azerbaijan, Armenia, uh, Georgia, a few others, and uh, major international actors and regional powers like Russia, Turkey, Iran, uh, to a lesser extent, uh, these last uh, several years, United States and European Union, they also have their interests. And so far, after the ceasefire in 1994, uh, Russia's ambition was to keep the conflict frozen, but not to go un uh, uh, until the, the final solution of the conflict, because Russia could keep uh, leverages on both sides. Now, Azerbaijan has changed a little bit the balance of power in, in its favor, and now Azerbaijan is... Uh, uh, trying to gain more diplomatically from, from its military uh, superiority from, uh, from Armenia. So the international actors, mediators like Russia, Turkey, etc., they also uh, have to um, uh, help these countries to find a definite, a final solution between Azerbaijan and Armenia and in order to try to satisfy both countries, to find a compromise, which is not easy, I agree, but nothing is impossible. No, nothing is impossible. And again, I'll put it to you, Jacques-Marie Lossian, is the common ground uh, this idea that if you uh, are able to uh, shore up uh, transit hubs, be they road or rail, it's win-win for both Armenia and Azerbaijan? Uh, I, I would agree if the situation would be, uh, could, could have been a fair situation. 
On, on one side, you have a democracy, uh, Armenia. On the other side, you have a dictatorship. So you have a people who have been elected by their people, and twice the Armenian people had elections in uh, 2018 and recently in, in 2020, where Nicole Pachignan won the elections for the second time. On the other side, you have Mr. Aliyev. And we know Mr. Aliyev is acting like a dictator. So you cannot uh, negotiate. Uh, when you mention France and... So what, you're saying that until Azerbaijan becomes a democracy, there can't be a solution? I, I believe that it, it can't be a solution as long as Mr. Aliyev has totally a different agenda. It's an hidden agenda. What, what the international uh, community must understand, you, you cannot negotiate with Mr. Aliyev. He's always lying and manipulating things. When he says, just an example, the, the claim from the uh, uh, Azerbaijani government is we have been just reacting against Armenian provocation at the border. Why the hell would Armenian people attack or provoke Azerbaijanis? I was in Armenia for the last four days. The Armenian people want to live peacefully. There are absolutely no interest to make any provocation against But you heard Andre Kortinov mention that uh, it's volatile. Part of the reason it's volatile is, is that uh, these borders are ill-drawn, the maps date back to Soviet times, and that it's very easy for things to, for a spark to light the fire. Uh, as you mentioned, and the, 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 the right term, it, it has been a frozen conflict since 1993, uh, uh, la last century. And uh, at the time the war started, these two states were uh, Soviet states. So at that time, nobody cared about what the frontier looks like. So it means when uh, uh, the Armenian part in Karabakh won some uh, uh, Azeri district, nobody cared about the delimitation of what they called Karabakh and Azerbaijan. Now, Azerbaijan has uh, uh, won the, the old district. And now the question is, where is exactly the frontier between Armenia and Azerbaijan? And there is a process with a group of Minsk, with uh, the three co-presidents, Russia, uh, United States and France, to find a way to validate the, the borders between Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan. We heard Thornike Gordadze mention how uh, the momentum after last year's war is clearly right now with Azerbaijan. And on November 9th, we saw commemorations on both sides of the border. In Yerevan, it was a solemn occasion. Remember, it was 44 days of fighting that left some 6,500 dead and uh, Armenia suffering a, a major defeat on the battlefield. There you see the, the prime minister laying a wreath. Uh, in Baku, November 9th was, well, more flag-waving and muscle-flexing. The country's president of 18 years, putting aside modesty as he looked to the future. As you witnessed, thousands and tens of thousands of Azeri youngsters, soldiers and officers clashed with the enemy and showed them their place. The enemy has been thrown into such a position that they will never be able to get out of it again. They will live forever as a defeated nation and a defeated state. Uh, they will live forever as a defeated nation and a defeated state. Javid Agaz, that does not sound like someone who wants to make peace. Um, the peace has different meanings for both Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Before the war, uh, even during the war, you could say that we want peace, we want peace. But this had different meanings for uh, both of us. For Azerbaijanis, it was it meant that we retake Karabakh and then we sign a peace deal with Armenia that each other recognize our borders. For uh, Armenia, you already uh, know that the panelists have already mentioned that this was not the case. So. Uh, as for uh, Aliyev's speech, it is not the first, and it has been going on for a year now since the end of the war, that uh, because there was a huge disbelief in the government that Aliyevs are only stalling the situation, they are not actually wanting to get the, uh, Karabakh back. It was the, one of the major uh, criticisms, criticisms by opposition. Uh, who actually lost the first war to Armenia. 
So, uh, so he's rubbing it in both team. for what you're saying is the message is is both for the international community, but also for his domestic audience. Exactly. I agree. Yes, both. But, uh, he, and he also mentioned that uh, uh, during these 30 years of period, uh, Nicole Pashinyan and his democracy has only been in government for like two or three years now. And he, al he always mentioned Sarkisian and Kocharyan, previous governments, that the, who guys, uh, the guys who actually uh, accused of being authoritarian and who actually uh, invaded Karabakh in Azerbaijani eyes. So uh, Pashinyan is only seen as a, a new mere leader who does not really know how politics is going in Azerbaijani eyes. All right, so there's the, the point we haven't mentioned yet, which is uh, the man who brokered uh, Monday's truce, and that is Vladimir Putin. Uh, Andrei Kortinov, uh, right now, what's the calculus in Moscow? Oh, we've lost Moscow. We'll try to reconnect there with, uh, with Andrei Kortinov uh, once again. We're having trouble there uh, with, the, with the connection. Uh, um, let me put it to you, Tornike Gortadze. What's the calculus in, in, in Moscow? Uh, Russia has a military base in Armenia, mm -hmm. but it has warm ties with both sides. Uh, right now, you were saying how in the past it was uh, rooting for a frozen conflict. Is it still the case? Um, I think Russia's interest, as always, is to uh, keep uh, influence in the region and keep influence on both sides. That's why uh, Russia uh, stopped the war in uh, last year, a mm -hmm. year ago, in November 2020, when the Azeris were on the, uh, on the they were uh, almost uh, taking the, 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 the control of the whole region of the Karabakh, then Russia stopped the war to, to keep also Armenians a little bit uh, not to, to, totally defeated and to, 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 uh, to keep uh, good relations with Armenians, because Armenians were extremely disappointed by Russia's behavior during the, uh, the, the last year's conflict, because Russia not only uh, has a military base in Armenia, but uh, Armenia is a member of Russia brokered um, defense uh, union, where Russia has the obligation to defend Armenia's territory. This is not the case of Karabakh, which is internationally, according to the international law, is mm -hmm. not part of Armenia, but uh, Russia has uh, uh, ob the obligation to defend Armenia's territory. In exchange of this, Armenia abandoned a portion of its sovereignty to Russia this is since the last several years. So the Armenians were very disappointed, and um, uh, uh, Russia uh, tried to save its uh, role as a broker and also to save the role of uh, one of, of the maybe the only uh, true uh, uh, military ally of Armenia. Uh, since uh, several years, uh, the European Union and the United States are uh, helping Armenia to, to make democratic reforms. They are supporting the current government or, of Armenia, and I, I agree with the previous, um, uh, previous speakers that current Armenian government is, is much more democratic than the previous ones, and much uh, uh, more looking towards the West, but the West has no strategic influence, military influence in the region, only Russia and now Turkey, uh, together with Azerbaijan, have influence in the region. So Russia will do anything to, to keep the, both countries dependent on, on Russia. Uh, Russia's, it's not in Russia's interest to have Azerbaijan winning definitely and 100% and obtaining everything. Otherwise, Russia will lose influence on Azerbaijan, which is already much less dependent on Russia than Armenia, because Azerbaijan has its own uh, uh, resources, has very good relations with Turkey and appears as militarily also linked to, to Turkey. Uh, so Russia needs also to conserve this situation inside the Karabakh, to conserve its troops in Karabakh. Russia sent 2,000 uh, peacekeepers so, yes. uh, in, in Karabakh, in Karabakh, and uh, when it comes to Armenia also, uh, now uh, it's in Russia's interest not to allow Azerbaijan to go further and to, uh, uh, to have 100% victory over Armenia. Uh, Andrei Kortunov, do you agree that uh, the view from Moscow on Baku has changed over the past year, uh, or has changed certainly with the last year's war when they saw how Azerbaijan won so decisively? Well, I think that uh, definitely uh, there is uh, uh, a change in perception of Azerbaijan. Many in Moscow didn't believe that uh, uh, Azerbaijan was in a position to win over Armenia. 
Uh, and uh, I think that definitely they have to reassess the military capacity of Azerbaijan. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, what uh, uh, they should be concerned about is not exactly Azerbaijan, but rather the uh, growing role of Turkey in the region. Because uh, if uh, uh, Turkey has its foot in the doorway in uh, South Caucasus, it can reach out uh, to other parts of the former Soviet Union, including Central Asia and uh, maybe even uh, North Caucasus and uh, some uh, uh, Muslim uh, regions of the Russian Federation proper. Uh, and of course, uh, given the uh, pan-Islamic trends uh, and the neo-Ottoman trends uh, in the Turkish foreign policy, uh, that should be a matter of concern for politicians in Moscow. Yeah, and you, you uh, uh, mentioned wariness of Turkey, the game changer in last year's war was undoubtedly drones. Drones made, guess where? In Turkey, also in Israel, but mostly in Turkey, used by Azerbaijan to the surprise of the international community. One year on, Turkish made drones again making news, this time at the other end of the former Soviet empire, with Ukraine last month uh, using them against Russian-backed separatists in uh, the Donbass, in the east of Ukraine. And that has got President Putin lashing out, both at Turkey, but also at the European Union. Europe had an unintelligible response to this, and the U.S. even supported it. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials say outright that they deployed it and will continue to do so in the future. At the same time, they've organized unscheduled military exercises in the Black Sea. It's as if they don't want us to let down our guard. We'll let them know that we aren't letting our guard down. Jacques-Marie Lossian, are, are drones kind of changing the balance of power everywhere right now. Yes, we, we are. Uh, I am also a member of the uh, French uh, uh, Defense Committee in the uh, Assemblée Nationale. And uh, the, this conflict uh, was a, a high intensity conflict. Uh, the problem came from the fact that uh, the, the, on the Armenian side, uh, some people believed that uh, they were still able to counter uh, any uh, Azeri attack because the region is full of mountains. So the position, the defending position is always stronger uh, when you are attacked first. And uh, also they were uh, believing that what they did uh, 30 years ago was something repeatable. They were, uh, may I say, blind, because what happened 30 years ago, you had two countries that were Soviet countries and they were fighting with the same weapons the uh, Kalashnikov, the uh, T-55 on both sides. This time, it seems that the, uh, uh, on the Armenian side, no investment was made for, to uh, rearm. And then, during that time, Azerbaijan made a tremendous effort to modernize the weapons and to modernize the strategy. And of course, with drones, with uh, special um, weapons, uh, the Azeri army was really able to, to defeat the uh, Armenian army. And we've seen uh, the, there was a troop buildup by Russia near Ukraine's border last week that uh, has NATO uh, scrambling. Uh, again, it's uh, after this drone attack uh, by the Ukrainian uh, military, Turkish-made drones. Uh, it, it, why is it spooking Russia to that point? Can't they have drones of their own? Can't they have a, an answer to those drones? Uh, the, the challenge for Russia is that, uh, as far as I know, uh, the Russian economy is uh, not as strong as it was uh, during the uh, Soviet Union. And the uh, amount of, uh, let's say, dollars that the uh, Russian uh, state can dedicate to its uh, defense is lower than it was in the past. So the Russian army cannot be everywhere. They have uh, nuclear weapons. They have uh, nuclear submarines. Uh, nowadays, they have lost their uh, uh, aircraft carrier because it has been uh, damaged. So uh, the challenge for Mr. Putin is, of course, to be strong, but uh, they can't spend uh, a huge amount of money to, to do it. So they have to make a, a choice. Uh, Andre Kortnov, again, uh, we're talking about drones and drones made in Turkey. Well, you know, let, let me uh, put it in a slightly different perspective. I think that uh, the conflict uh, in Nagorno-Karabakh demonstrated that uh, you can resolve uh, territorial issues uh, using military force. 
And uh, that sets a, a very dangerous precedent uh, for all other frozen conflicts on the territory of the former Soviet Union, uh, because uh, politicians in Kiev or in Chisinau or elsewhere might decide, well, it worked for Aliyev, uh, it should work for us as well. And I think this is the concern that they have in Moscow, and this is uh, why uh, Moscow is trying to deter uh, potential military action by Kiev uh, by uh, uh, deploying more troops uh, on the border with Ukraine. They're concerned uh, that uh, this example, successful example of uh, President Aliyev, uh, might be replicated in other parts where Russia's interests are more significant than in case of Nagorno-Karabakh. So Tornike Gordadze, does that mean just everyone, if everyone just goes out and buys drones, is it uh, uh, a zero-sum game and we're back to square one? Mm -mm. Um, yeah, let, let's come back to, to this uh, Ukraine and the military buildup that takes place actually uh, currently uh, on the borders of Ukraine. Uh, because what we see on, from the Russian side is uh, unprecedented um, uh, gathering of uh, all types of troops that was reported by different, including uh, by independent sources, uh, since uh, 2014 uh, and the, uh, the invasion of uh, eastern Ukraine by, by Russia. So the, the uh, Ukrainians plus uh, the European Union and NATO are extremely concerned by the, by the situation. And that's why all the uh, European leaders uh, were talking to, with uh, Vladimir Putin and making some quite harsh statements. Also, uh, the American uh, the, the director of the Central Intelligence Ag Agency, uh, uh, William Burns, was also in Russia several, um, a week ago or 10 days ago, uh, and he uh, also warned Russia to stop this military buildup. So I don't, the, the fact that Ukrainians are getting drones from Turkey is something uh, normal. Each country tries to, to catch up in, the, in this, uh, 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 in this uh, modernization of its military forces. I don't think the Ukrainians are planning right now to invade uh, by the way, it's <laughs> their uh, internationally recognized territory. So, but they are not planning to, to go further and to, uh, to, um, to retake back uh, some parts of Donbass that is currently not under their control. Because it's uh, uh, now what I see that most of Ukrainians and the Ukrainian government tries to, to uh, consolidate the, 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 the rest of Ukraine to, to go and to, to get as close as possible with NATO membership. Uh, starting a new war in, in the, or, or escalating the new war which will not allow Ukraine to get closer with NATO because they know that most of European countries, especially Western Europeans, they will not take Ukraine on board uh, uh, in, in the conflict with Russia. So it's in Ukraine's interest for me to, f to freeze the conflict in Eastern Ukraine in, in, uh, in this part of Donbass that is not under their control and to consolidate their, uh, their institutions and to get as close as possible to NATO and EU membership. This is in their interest. Uh, Javid Agal, let me, let me ask you, because I, I didn't get a chance earlier. Uh, the, the, right now, where you're sitting in Baku, uh, what's the view when they, when they see the rivalry between Russia and Turkey, and when they see, again, those Turkish-made drones that have helped out uh, Azerbaijan in, in last year's war? Uh, again, that... that uh, is there still the feeling that it's a former Soviet state, or is there a feeling that perhaps Azerbaijan is looking elsewhere? Um, I don't think that we are looking elsewhere, but we are not uh, either a former Soviet country anymore. I mean, uh, there has been a huge uh, amount of Russian speaking uh, schools and uh, in the society, but it's changing. People are more English speaking right now. And uh, after the war, um, people have been uh, in some sort of um, happy uh, feeling that everything is going to be all right with this pride. And but after the uh, after a week, a year later, they are now asking what's going to what's going to happen now. Are we going to go back to settle, are we going to rebuild Karabakh? And there's going to be a lot of uh, investments from uh, European uh, co companies and uh, Turkish companies as well. And also, of course, uh, some Russian, and me but these are the minimized. Do people some in Azerbaijan Russian feel Iranian closer to Turkey or to Russia? 
we were always we always felt closer to Turkey. Like it has mm -hmm. been uh, for 30 years now. I'm 28 year old and I've learned Turkish from TV. So we have been very uh, close, and uh, there have been Turkish schools in Azerbaijan. Azer Azerbaijanis mostly go to Turkish universities to study. Their media, their culture uh, really affects us. We are leading uh, world classics from Turkish translations mostly. So it is changing. But uh, I would not say that it's going towards Europe, but somewhere in the middle. Well, we're coming up to the 30th anniversary of the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And uh, even before uh, the, uh, an, uh, the announcement uh, uh, back on in December of 1991, Armenia and Azerbaijan were already at war, as Jacques-Marie Rossian was saying earlier. Uh, here we can show images uh, from 1991. Uh, Jacques, when you look with hindsight at those images, what goes through your mind? Uh, what we just said recently, uh, we have two different questions. One is strategic, with a high-intensity conflict like the one we have seen la last year. The challenge for Russia and maybe also for other uh, armies is how can we respond to a massive drone attacks? Uh, what is our flexible response? And this is a challenge for many, many uh, armed forces in the world. And when you look at these images from 30 years ago? Yes. Uh, at that time, the conflict was not religious. Because you had two, two states, uh, Armenia and, and uh, Azerbaijan, who were two former Soviet Union states. It's what a question just of territory does or not uh, Karabakh can take its independence from uh, uh, Azerbaijan. What has changed the last 30 years, mainly because of Turkey, Mr. Erdogan wants to become the leader in that region, a Muslim leader. And that's why nowadays uh, we have this problem that the expansion, expansionism of, of Turkey in South uh, Mediterranean and, of course, in Caucasus creates a problem because under a, a religious flag, uh, now he can have a connection with Azerbaijan and a few other countries. Tor Tornike Gordadze, is this how you read it? Um, I don't fully agree with this religious uh, component of the conflict. There is a religious component, but this is not very important so far. Just just to remind that Turkey is a is a Sunni country. Ninety ninety percent or or more of the Turkish population is Sunni, and uh, seventy percent of Azerba Azerbaijanis are are Shia. So this is one one huge difference. And also, Azerbaijani state is very strongly. Uh, a secular state and themselves, the, the President Aliyev, even if uh, we can criticize him a lot about democracy, he's someone who is really afraid of religious extremism. So he was the, the, the friendship or um, uh, alliance between uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan is an old al alliance, which is more cultural and ethnic, uh, based on cultural and ethnic proximity and also on geopolitics. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mr. Erdogan wants to play a role in, in South Caucasus to reach also uh, Central Asia from across the Caspian. But I don't think in this particular dossier he's playing the religious card. He may play the religious card somewhere else with, uh, with different networks of linked mm -hmm. to Muslim brotherhoods, etc. But in this particular region, I don't think he's playing the, the religious card. It's more uh, geostrategic. Uh, and also the competition with Russia is very important because on one side we see them uh, appearing Turkey and Russia as allies when it comes, when they try together to diminish Western influence in different regions of the, of the world. But on the other side, there is a huge competition between them. Uh, Ukraine, Black Sea, Caucasus, uh, Balkans, Syria, uh, Libya. These mm -hmm. are the cases where Turkey and Russia are clashing. The only thing that keeps them together and they, they don't trust uh, each other, I can, I can tell you, is that both agree on the fact that they don't want the West to be very influent in the, the, in the countries that I've just mentioned. All right, that's their common ground. Tornike Gordadze, I want to thank you so much for joining us from Berlin. Andrei Kortinov in Moscow. Uh, Javid Aga in uh, Baku. Jacques-Marie Lossian, thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.